to the previous meeting. Are there any corrections or additions? I move that they be accepted as read. Second. <clears throat> All in favor? So moved. Move quickly. All right, correspondence that we have received. We have received a letter from Jay Staples regarding the Bigelow Road private access way, a memo from the Public Works Director regarding Bigelow Way, letter from G. Schumacher regarding Fitzpatrick multi-use building, and a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Best <coughs> regarding the Fitz Fitzpatrick multi-use building. Uh, a letter from Christopher and Jane Bullis uh, regarding Riccio's additional five feet of building envelope space. A letter from R. Silmore regarding the Bigelow private access way. A letter from Entwistle regarding the Bigelow Private Access Way, a letter from Elizabeth Crane regarding the Bigelow Road Ac Private Access Way, a letter from Robert Crane regarding the Bigelow Road Private Access Way, a letter from Robert O'Malley regarding the Bigelow Road Private Access Way, <coughs> and a um, a letter from Mike Hill, town attorney, regarding the Bigelow Road private access way easement deed. First item on our agenda is Blueberry Ridge, Lot 7 subdivision amendment. Deb and Steve Riccio are requesting an amendment to the previously approved Blueberry Ridge subdivision to increase the size of the building envelope for Lot 7, U34, 17-7, Section 16-2-5, Amendments to a Previously Approved Subdivision. This is a con consent agenda item which typically does not include a presentation by the applicant. If a board member would like to have a substantive discussion of the application, a motion should be made to move the item to the regular agenda. Otherwise, a motion to approve the request would be in order. We do have one letter from an above, <coughs> and that is the uh, Bullis letter. Uh, question for Maureen. Uh, would we normally move something off the consent agenda, Maureen, if we have a letter from an interested party that's opposing the... Uh... It, it's at your discretion. You, you usually do um, allow someone who's written a letter the opportunity to speak on the item. There was one exception where there was an amendment to the uh, the Little League building, concession building at Plaisted Park, where there was a letter written and you determined that the letter was not applicable to the issue before you. But typically you do allow the me a member of the public to speak if they indicate they're interested. Do uh, you know whether these people are here tonight? Uh, no, they're not here tonight. They, they did call me and they, they were coming and I said, there's nothing on the agenda that would allow you an opportunity to speak, and if you want to have an opportunity to speak, you really do need to put something in writing right away, and that's why you received the, the letter you have received. I didn't tell them they should show up no matter what, so, you know, I can't tell you that they're not here because they don't care. Where's your... This is the applicant. Oh, the applicant. Just, I think she's just here to, if you have any questions. Do you want, do you have something you want to say to us about this or? We're just looking to gain five feet, which is within the, you know, the zone of Blueberry Ridge for a 15 foot setback versus a 20 foot setback on the one side and it abuts Chris Bolas' property. Have you had an opportunity to talk to them at all? Yeah, we spoke after the workshop, and Chris seemed agreeable then. He also was under the impression at that point that there was going to be a, um, a buffer put in, and there isn't. So I don't know if that changed his mind. I mean, yeah. So she talked. I'm waiting for the, her to finish speaking. Go ahead. Just... I, that may have changed or may have precipitated, you know, the letter and the concern that there would be something there. But he and I had actually discussed, you know, plantings and, and whatever. And it's my understanding, too, that he has an eight-foot easement, which would actually drop his um, setback to 12 feet on his side. 
I, I think at this point I, I'm prepared to move that this be removed from the consent agenda and put on the regular agenda. You make that as a motion? I, I just did. <laughs> I'll second, second. the motion. Oh. Okay, everybody in favor? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now that you've moved it to the regular agenda, what do you want to do with it? What do we want to do with it now that we've moved it to the regular agenda? Well, I think we'd probably want to move it to the next month's next month meeting so that the person who wrote the letter could have an opportunity to speak. Table it to a public hearing. Sure. May I have a motion? Dave. You want to do it, Jack? I'll do it. <laughs> I, I think it's the view of the board that uh, we would like to uh, move this to our next meeting uh, to give the uh, butter that has questions a chance to speak. Second. Hi, everybody in favor? Oh, any discussion? I'm sorry. Could could I ask that you specifically call that a public hearing so that we are in a certain process that allows us to provide proper notification? Can I amend that to include a public hearing that night? Do we have a second? Second. Further discussion? No. All in favor? <clears throat> I will now consider the uh, Graham Pillsbury, who is requesting a private access way permit to construct a driveway within a road right of way to access the lot of Katahdin Road, U12-5C. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-7-9 private access ways. And will the applicant, Mr. Lesbury, please begin, who is representing the applicant, um, by Adam, summarizing any changes. Madam Chairman, can yes. I speak yes. regarding my position? Um, I wanted to make note to the board and for the record that my son does work for the architect that is doing the project, but I don't feel as though uh, I'll leave it up to the rest of the board to discuss this, but I don't think that my involvement in that case uh, uh, should uh, uh, recuse me from or force me to recuse. I think I can handle this issue with a bi unbiased feelings towards it. Any questions? I have no problem. No problem. Uh, I don't either. Good please? evening. Uh, my name is Les Berry. I'm an engineer with BH2M Engineers in Gore, Maine. And I work on many jobs with Mitchell Associates and uh, then several jobs in Cape Elizabeth. I was at the uh, site clock uh, two weeks ago. And uh, so I got to meet several of the neighbors at that time, plus the planning board, and we reviewed several of the issues that are involved. And with me tonight is uh, Graham Pillsbury also, if we have any direct questions for him. Uh, since the uh, planning board meeting, we've added five trees in the back of the proposed lot as a buffer, which was requested on the site block uh, for the benefit of the, about just to give a little screening. Uh, what we're doing is we're proposing a private access way and a public right-of-way. The public right-of-way is 50 feet wide, and we're proposing a 14-foot paved uh, access way with two-foot gravel shoulder and ditches on each side. And the total length is 186 feet with a hammerhead turnaround. The lot, as we noticed out of the uh, site walk, was at the top of the hill, and the building window begins just about at the top of the hill. Uh, the biggest issue that we had over the site walk, in my opinion, was the drainage. Uh, last fall, before the Mitchell Associates began working on the job, they notified me that they had the job coming up, and, and I went out and did a complete site walk prior to the snow, so I got a good chance to see what was going on before you know, things got the way they are today. And, I wrote a drainage report that should be in your package, and even before the calculations, uh, I came to the conclusion that there's a drainage problem out in the area, specifically uh, the house on the other side of Katarina Street. At the time, I didn't have a name or face to it, but you know, I met them out on the sidewalk. What it is is 
there's a large amount of runoff that drains down through the intersection across the street. There's a catch basin located across the street, and but it really has no curbing and can't trap water and it just runs right through their yard. The other problem is water coming down the old right of way and down the hill. At this point, it's in the ditch, and there's a eight inch culvert at this point to a catch basin across the street. And even before doing the calculations, it was quite obvious to me that that eight inch culvert was undersized and water was probably going over the top of the street during big storm events. I did the calcs, and that's exactly what's happening. And so, you know, looking at the site, I said, what do we have the power to fetch on this? And the biggest solution I could see was to replace the 8-inch pipe with a 12-inch pipe. A 12-inch pipe has more than twice the capacity of an 8-inch pipe, so it was a pretty good improvement that way. The other thing we could do is enlarge the ditch on this side to give it more storage volume before it could have a chance to go over the top. And so we ran it with the two 10 and 25-year storms and was able to solve that. In the post-development plan, we also took this area, the strains down from here now, and we're going to have a little ditch along the side of the house to carry the water down towards our road and into the new pipe, which will help alleviate a little bit of the flow in this area. So the net result is I think we've got a better situation. It's not a complete solution for the red downstream, but it's uh, all we can do within the power of this site. Could we perhaps put that up so the audience can see it too? Thank you. Okay, the, the other issue I'd like to discuss is the, uh, we proposed a road that is sloped to one side. We, we proposed crowning the road, not actually crowning, but sloping it directly in this side to get it down into the ditch and through the piping system. The comments back from the town consulting engineer in Bob Valley, they'd like the crowned road. And, uh, you know, it's the, you know, I understand what they're asking for, because ever a public road, they certainly want it crowned. This is a private access road, and if it was ever to be made a public road, you wouldn't want to come in and pave a three or four foot strip on each side of the road. You'd grind it up and repave the entire road. So, you know, we prefer to have a crown sloped one direction because a single lane road, if you put, has a crown on it, it's awful hard to plow. What it is to plow would go on one side and leave, you know, three or four inches of snow on the other side, and it'd take a couple passes to you know, tipping the plow each direction to make it go. As I said, it's not a big issue either way, but we just prefer it's going to be taken care of, maintained privately, that we keep it uh, crowned one direction versus two directions. So, I mean, we'll be, you know, the board can consider either way, but, you know, we just prefer it this way, but if you wanted to go with the crowning two directions, it's okay. It isn't going to hurt anything, except it's just going to make it difficult for us to plow. And uh, so with that, we'll Turn back to board. Thank you. We'll now open the public hearing. I'm going to ask people who are speaking to please hold their comments to three minutes. We have quite a crowd and there are, I'm sure, a number of you who want to say something. The public hearing is now open. Please identify yourself when you come up to the podium. And also, please give your address. Um, good evening. My name is Sue Garrett, and I live at Tukatadin Road, which is the um, house that has all the water drainage issues. And I have some information here that I think is very important for the board to consider um, that I'd like to give to you before I begin my three minutes. First, I want to thank you for a public hearing tonight, and I also want to thank you for coming to our neighborhood for the walkthrough. It is much appreciated. Um, I have one concern where I would like to start that I think many have jumped to the conclusion that a lot exists and therefore bring on the road. That is point Z. I would like to discard our discussion back at point A and make sure we research all the unanswered questions before we decide what to do with this paper street. I therefore, because of the emotions in this situation, took the fact of a lot totally out of the picture and just asked myself, just with a paper street there, forget about any lots in the background, would this be developed? And I can submit to you honestly, legally, historically and professionally, it's a resounding no. You will hear from my neighbors several issues. 
You will hear of the issue of the historical intent of the Shore Acres Land Company. You will see deeds presented to you that says several of these lots on the left-hand side of this paper street are not to be subdividable and have covenants on them that they can only maintain one house on the property. You will hear that the master plan of the town has possible greenbelt um, sites for this property. And you will also hear from the neighbors that talk about the beauty of the trees, over a hundred which will have to come down, the deer that romp through there, and all the other aspects of um, Cape Elizabeth's respect for land preservation that go with it. I just want to address my two personal concerns about a paper street there. As you know, the water situation of our home is nightmarish. We have had multiple water and runoff issues. We call public works at all hours of the night. We have purchased insurance sewer backup, and we have hired Skip Murray to install our own drain in our driveway. This is all prevented water on the driveway side, but we still have endless days and nights of worry on the Wayborn side. Through the frost heaves, winter rains, and underlying ledge and snow melt, the storm drain at the corner of Wayborn and Katahdin is not always effective, as most times it gets blocked up by snow and the water flows into our property before it ever reaches the storm drain. Speaking with Mr. Malley, he too is concerned about the added water. All the more reasons we should not risk adding any more water to the situation. Currently, we can handle no more water in our yard, and we are concerned that this proposal of drainage seems to imply that all new drainage created will be taken care of. But our concern is that nature is nature, and you can't separate what is old barrette water and what is new water that is coming into the area from Bigelow Way. It's scientifically impossible. Runoff has our address written all over it. Removing the roots, soil, gravel, trees, and leaves that are on Bigelow Way is going to significantly deplete the natural drainage system that exists and is the only protection we now have. So we had submit in accordance with the zoning ordinance, the sewer system proposals cannot be proven as sufficient and the development of a paper street should not be approved. Our second concern because of our small children is the site distance issue. As Ms. O'Meara referenced, the site distance is 250 feet. We have had a local engineer measure, measure this, and I have submitted photos with my letter telling you that to the left, the site distance is only 90 feet up Trundy Road towards the stop sign. It is only 140 feet to Wayben. It is also 160 down towards Pilot Point on one side and 200 on the other. We understand in the past, the zoning ordinance have made exceptions to these site um, zoning ordinances, but we ask that our, dif our situation is completely different as we already have multiple existing driveways and intersecting roads. Safety should be all our concerns. Accidents happen in an instant and we do not need to create more hazards. We encourage the town's engineer to measure the site distance before any approval of a paper street is given. Thus, we respectfully ask you to start at point A and look at all these unresolved issues. The mere fact that a lot is created does not create a road. There were other avenues to this lot through the existing front property. That has now been sold. We submit since the developer voluntarily forfeited his own access way by his property, we should not be burdened by this decision merely because there's a lot back there. We need to look at all the factors. Um, the community leaders before us have understood that people choose to live in Cape Elizabeth for these reasons, the space, preservation, and protection of our beautiful natural resources. You will see the deeds that have been submitted will show you that on the left-hand side of the paper street, they are all prohibited from being developed. These are granted from the Shore Acres Land Trust Company. We do not know the history of the deed submitted on the right side of the paper street, which includes the uh, lot from Mr. Pillsbury. We want you to know that the historical tent of the deeds from the Shore Acres Land Company clearly say that these lots are not intended to be built on. We just ask the zoning board right now to press the pause button on this issue and resource the multiple issues raised. The water issues, the weather lots are actually develop developable by the deeds, the site distance issue. This road has been not built on in over 100 years and we do not see the sense of urgency to build on it now. We would really respect all unanswered questions and issues to be researched before a decision is made. Thank you. Somebody else? Good evening. 
Uh, my name is Bob Crane, and I live at 2 Waveman Road, which is just across the way from the Pillsbury properties. I'd like to make two points. First, I'd like to draw you a picture. I live across the street, directly across the street from the Pillsbury property, as I mentioned. A week, a week ago, I got up, got dressed, looked out the window, and there were eight deer, mature deer, standing in my backyard. They were standing at attention, waiting for their leader to give them a signal, and they were waiting for actually a car to go up the street. The car went by, leader gave the signal, and they trotted across the street, right into the woods, the woods which we now call a paper street. I described that picture not to uh, not to uh, appeal to your wildlife sympathies, but just to emphasize the bottom line here. This property is not a street. It's never been a street. It's not intended to be a street. It's not appropriate to be a street. It ex it exists. Uh, on paper, that's it. Adjoining property owners have never envisioned that it would be a street. As mentioned already, adjoining property owners to the street bought their properties because they understood there would not be a street, and they also have, some of them have it in their deeds, as I understand it, that it is not buildable, and therefore not a street. It is, in fact, an attractive woodland, a wildlife trail, an open space for the enjoyment of walkers, off-road walkers. It's, it's therefore a, a space, an open space for all Shore Acres residents, who, all of whom have legal, implied legal rights to the street. My second point is about the green belt. Why do we have a green belt? Well, according to this little leaflet put out by Cape Elizabeth, a green belt not only provides an opportunity for healthful outdoor activity, such as walking and cross-country skiing, but also preserves open space, usually of high value, for both wildlife habitat and scenic beauty. I have a copy I have a, a copy of the official Green Belt map, which shows the extension of the Green Belt at this point. And this plan shows that the Green Belt is already within spitting distance of the property that we're talking about. Not only that, but the street is already, as I understand it from the land trust, this, this area, this paper street area, is already uh, looked at as a potential further extension of the Green Belt. So why would the town planners abort this potential by permitting what amounts to a commercial development an interruption, an intrusion into a potential green belt area. I think we need to establish our priorities and find out what is the mo more important, the commercial development of the lots or an extension of our green belt and visions. Thank you. Is there somebody else who would like to speak? Thank you for the hearing. Uh, I'm Betty Crane, and uh, I'm following my husband, although we don't always think the same way. 
but I certainly agree with him on, on many of the points he made. Um, I did send a letter to um, all of the planning board, and I hope you've had a chance to read it. had my primary concerns. We live to Wayburn, as Bob said, which is diagonally across the street from the property in question and across the street from uh, the Gourettes. And I've often thought when I get up sometimes, or I don't know what the weather is, I just look across the street to the big huddle on the corner by the rest. I can tell by looking at that puddle if it's raining. And that puddle is there most of the time. So obviously, <coughs> this drainage is not going to be taken care of <coughs> by Mr. Pillsbury's plan because it, it's drainage that's been there all along and it's not being affected by the paper street because it's not coming from there now, but it would be coming from there later. My primary concern, I agree with everything that Sue says. There are a lot of issues here, and there's a lot of conflicting evidence kicking around, and I feel really strongly that this should be tabled at the very least. I would hope you would deny the permit, but I do think it should be studied because this is an important issue we have with open space. It really is a lovely area, and I hate to see all those trees destroyed just to get into one lot. It would be entirely different if the lot were right on the street. Then you'd only have to take down the vegetation where the house was going to be. But in this case, you're going to have to put in this private access way which means heavy equipment, I would assume, and all these drainages and so forth. And it's going to take down a lot of the natural vegetation, which is enjoyed by a lot of people, as well as the deer and the animals. Um, I'm, I'm primarily concerned with open space. Shore Acres is well developed. We don't have big lots. We're not tight in there, but our lots are, are very average size. And I don't think we need to open up another paper street, even though this is going to be a private access. <clears throat> That's another point. I know that I can still walk on that property. I can walk up that access, even though it's going to look like a drive. It's going to look like a private driveway. But because I've lived there so long, I know that I can walk on it. But I think the people that are going to live there in the future, they're they're going to begin to feel it, it's really going to inhibit them that this is a driveway into this house. So I ask you to really consider all these issues and you know, think mostly about the open space that's so precious to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Bob Tripler. I live on Trundy Road, and uh, I can't see this property from where I live, but if I take a look, I go past it, and I appreciate its beauty, and I just like hope that you don't make a judgment uh, based on the number of people who talk. <coughs> One of the reasons I got up here is I wanted to point out that a lot of people in this room have the opinion, but not everybody gets up in front of a microphone. I uh, just thought I'd add my, my words to what's been said already. Uh, appreciation of the nature, uh, the fact of potential for the green belt, and uh, the fact that we don't really need any more development around here. That's all. Thank you. Yes, you did. Uh, my name is Jan Staples. I live at 27 Trendy Road. And uh, the rear property line of my home, which is an historical home built in 1894, um, is uh, or shares the rear property line with the, the lot that we are uh, discussing this evening. And while I, while I too have a number of the concerns that have been brought up before, um, I don't want to repeat those. I would simply like to add a little bit of new information. 
Uh, when we did the site walk, and we appreciate the time that all of you gave to us on that walk, especially on an early Saturday morning, um, I, I learned that the footprint of the proposed house is now going to sit further back in the lot, which brings it closer to my rear property line. And while people assure me that there is a, a kind of a 20-foot um, buffer that is required, um, 20 feet is really not all that much. When you think about it, it's, it's something like from here to over, to right over there. And this is, a, this is an old historical home. It was um, actually, um, other than the original farmhouse, the first house to be built in that part of Cape Elizabeth. And it happens to abut the most shallow part of my backyard. So I, I hope you understand that because we have learned that a number of the other lots are not buildable, that essentially what we're talking about is kind of dropping a house, a single house, into the middle of this wooded area. And there are a number of us who would be adversely and forever impacted um, by that new construction. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Yeah, um, <coughs> I'm new to Cape Elizabeth. I just moved in here at the beginning of the year. Could you please identify yeah, yourself well, and David say where Robert, you're... sorry. Uh, 24 Trundy Road. I have my property abuts the uh, property that's being talked about now. And actually, I'd like to know where exactly the house is being planned on built on that lot, Russell, if you could tell me that. The uh, envelope. Okay, and that's, okay, and my house is here. So, this is going to be the whole house? No, that's just the building envelope. That's the building envelope. So, are you going to be above the ridge there? Are you, how, um, are you going to be blasting in that, there's a big ledge going across you know, there. Is that going to be we, we are going to be talking about that. Okay. as we discuss this, but if you would just state how you, you know, your opinion of this, which we can, will become part of Well, I just worry about, you know, if they're going to be blasting in there, that my house already gets water in the basement. It's getting water in the basement right now, and if they're going to blast on that ledge, then, you know, it could, you know, hurt several foundations around there, including the one that he just sold, and, you know, you just don't know what to, uh, yeah, you just don't know what's going to happen when you start blasting around there as far as radon goes or, uh, you know, anything like that. You know, am I going to, you know, I haven't had a radon test yet, but, I mean, you know, you just never know what kind of a can of worms you're opening up by, you know, blasting on ledge with his houses all around him. So, um, also, my daughter came up to me yesterday, or, you know, two or three days ago and said, yeah, Daddy, we saw a deer out in the backyard yesterday. And I kind of like the deer out in the backyard, and I'm not so sure that that's, you know, not going to go away if that happens. And not just because of Russell's house, but, uh, you know, it's just going to open up a can of worms. Is everybody going to start building lots, uh, building houses on all that open space in there? You just, you know, I just don't know. So that's my uh, feeling. Thank you. My name is Joe Garrett. I live at Two Katahdin Road. And um, basically what I just want to present to you tonight is not only my concern for safety, uh, it's very difficult as it is right now to back out of my driveway. I think, Barbara, you can attest to that when you turned around in my driveway. It took three or four mm -hmm. times. I just had that problem the other day. Backing out of my driveway, coming on to Waveman Road and you know, this potential road is going to present even more of a problem. I'm very concerned uh, with safety issue with my children. I have very young children, five, seven, and nine, that ride bikes on the street and so forth. And I just want to make sure that we do take the time to research the site setbacks and so forth, that you as the panel take the time to, to go in depth and research that. I'm not going to go into my water issue because it's very obvious. 
Um, but I do want to point out that we have done um, some research on the deeds on the left-hand side of the proposed paper street, all of which um, are in their deed are non-buildable and they cannot be subdivided. Um, we ask that the board uh, carefully research the intent of the deeds on the opposite side of the street uh, as we have not been able to uh, fully understand each and every deed on the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could, would you mind leaving that up, please? Keep it up? Please. Yes. Hi there, I'm uh, George N. Twistle. I'm one of the abutters. I'm at 2 Avon Road. Um, and I guess I just, um, I guess I'd re emphasize uh, the first speaker's point, which is, you know, we seem to be somewhere way down the line, and I'm not really sure that we started at point A. Um, there seems to be lots of issues. Uh, where we live, I think we have the largest parcel of land in this immediate area. Um, there have been lots of questions asked and interestingly enough um, a variety of answers to the same question um, I, I don't think that you know I for one am not interested in uh, denying anyone their property rights but I sure would like to know the true and legal answers for things that are going to affect my property um, and clearly this will affect my property. Um, the lot runs directly along the sideline of my property, and where this where this house is being proposed um, seems like it will be within 20 feet of my house. Um, right now, our house, again, a historical house, one of the original houses, was set at the very middle of one and a half acres specifically for privacy purposes. This lot then, again, somebody described it nicely, it sort of seems like it just appeared in the middle of nowhere, and it couldn't be any closer to this uh, gentleman's house who just bought the house next to us, our house, and the historic house um, uh, that, um, that your, your house, yeah. Mrs. Uh, Ms. Staples' house. Um, you couldn't you couldn't pick a more awkward sighting for a house in terms of devaluing three very valuable homes that we have all um, specifically acquired uh, and developed because of their value. So you know some of, some of what we've heard defies logic, and I'll just give you one example. As the immediate abutter, we were told two meetings ago that although there are lots further up the paper road, that they would not be able to be developed unless I, as the immediate abutter, developed my land. Um, which seems as though I've got a lot of power in terms of the value of other people who live up the way. Again, sort of defying logic. I, I know that was an answer that was given. It didn't make sense to me then. It doesn't make sense to me now. Um, there's lots of questions about this paper road, and I think the appropriate thing to do, again, if, if somebody has rights, then we don't want to deny them, but we want to make sure that our rights are exercised in terms of fully understanding the legal and appropriate um, interpretation of this paper road. You look and see on the right-hand side that they refer to, some, there are lots, other they're not, they're, they're not identified as lots. But what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, I, with the largest piece there, I don't have a lot, or do I? I'm not really sure. But since it's significant value that we're talking about here, decrease in value in terms of a, a home sort of plopped in my, in view of my family room, um, we need to have these answers. And I think that um, it's only appropriate that this board would, would want to make sure that all of us do have answers um, uh, to these very important questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? The public hearing is now closed. Do you want to come back up again and we can ask questions? Okay, if I could just take a minute to address a couple of the question, uh, questions posed. Uh, the question of the butter downstream, the caret and the drainage problem. It is a big problem, you know, and I think we recognized that when we were out at the site. We did that drainage report. We've done everything we can to reduce the flow crossing the road. And I know I work for the applicant, so I know the butter's a little suspect of what I would present. But I think this has been reviewed by the town's consulting engineer and the public works director, which uh, agreed with my report. So I think, uh, I think we're all set there. Uh, as far as the historical intent and the, uh, whether it's a street or not, this is the subdivision plan behind me, and it's, it's a street. It's always been a street, you know, street ever since it was a subdivision, and it's just, uh, you know, until it's de you know, developed into a street. Okay, answering the question uh, of whether this was, is a road or was intended to ever be a road, the subdivision plan that's on the board behind me uh, shows it as a street, a public right of way. And everyone that bought into the subdivision, you know, just had to read the subdivision plan and would know that it's a road. Uh, as far as tabling the plan, you know, we would like the, the board to act tonight. Uh, we believe we've met all the criteria required in the zoning ordinance, so we'd like to proceed with that. <clears throat> and as far as the setbacks go, there were two abutters that mentioned that. It's a 20-foot side setback and rear setback that's to the building window. The building wouldn't necessarily go back that far or be that big. In the building window, which is shown here, it's this, this wide, I mean this long and this wide. There's an abutting house, here's another abutting house. And so, you know, it's not gonna occupy the entire building window. And it's, it's just the developer, the applicant can choose where he wants to put the house in there, which is most, you know, as he wants to lay the house out. As far as blasting goes, uh, the applicant is not intending to blast. It's going to hammer the ledge out so we don't have any blasting. And uh, the site distance, uh, we've measured it, and it's 250 feet or greater in both directions. And, uh, you know, that's been also reviewed by the town engineer and the public works director. And uh, as far as the the comments about non-dividable lots, non lots on the left side, that's not true with the lot in question here. It is dividable and the can proceed. There's no, there's no deed restrictions. So that's answered the most question, I believe. I'm sorry, but we cannot take any more comments from the audience. It's only during a public hearing. Do you want to stay up there, Les, because sure. we're going to have questions for you. Questions from the board. The first question I had was the um, sightline distances. Can you describe for me the process uh, that you went through to get those? Because, frankly, that's the issue that jumped out at me from the site walk and from what we've heard from several of the abutters, and I just want to know how how you walk through that process. It, what we're talking about is intersection site distance. Right. That is, it's 10 feet back from the edge of pavement. It's looking with an eye at 3.75 feet high at an object 4.25 feet high. And uh, it, in the ordinance it says uh, seven seconds of a site distance. If you crank through 25 miles an hour, 36 feet per second, it's 250 feet. Okay. And so uh, if you go back uh, 10 feet and then set your eyeball at 3.75 feet high and turn each direction, you can see either way fine. And you have to look over the, I mean, right now, I'm not sure if you went out there today because of the snowbank, and the snowbank and stone count in sight distance. No, I, I understand that. So just to follow up on your last phrase, you said you could see in both directions fine, but how did you make, you made the statement that there's a 250-foot sightline distance. Yes. 
how did you measure that given those parameters which sound pretty exacting from that 3.75 feet 10 feet behind the road where did you measure the 4.5 okay. feet out 250 feet on either side at the driveway entrance at this location we've got an edge of pavement mm -hmm. we can back 10 feet up the existing driveway set the our eyeball at 3.75 feet then if you look you can have somebody up in each direction go out there till you can't see them any far. See the you know 4.75, 4.25 feet high elevation, and you just figure out where they are on the road, and then draw a straight line to that. And each way is a plenty of distance. If to scale, this is a one inch equals 20 scale, so 250 feet is 12 and a half inches. This plan is two feet wide, so it's approximately half the distance. Of, of the plan. So if, if it's there, 250 feet is about that far. You know, you miss the house and it's easy to see that way. And then there's no problem looking this way. There's a little bit of a roll in the hill there, but it's, uh, you can see the, uh, any car fairly easy. Actually, I'm more, I'm more satisfied it's to the left than the right looking out from the driveway. There's a pretty good crest coming over from the ocean side, the Pilot Point side, toward the driveway, isn't there? Yes, but you don't lose an object 4.25 feet high going over the crest of it. See, the th thing is, you're looking from... No, I understand how it works. I'm just, uh, I'm skeptical just from my being out there. To my memory, that drops off. Katahdin drops off pretty quickly going down toward Algonquin, to my memory. I mean, I, I didn't go out there with the tape measure, and, and I asked you to walk me through the process. You walked okay. me through very right. clearly, looking clearly looking back up waving. I'm just, uh, it just doesn't strike me as You're not meshing with my memory from being out there. The line of sight is not horizontal. It doesn't have to necessarily be horizontal. It goes up and down with the hill. So if you're, right. at, you're with your eyeball, is if you look over the crest of the hill, you wouldn't lose it uh, because you're looking downhill. Right. And so it's uh, it's really quite fine there, and uh, I mean certainly it can be demonstrated if anyone wants to go out there and look. And but it's uh, it, it's not that bad. Can I see those pictures, Barbara? Thank you. That's all the questions I have for the engineer. I, I, do, I would like to see that plan closely because I, we were shown. Oh, Maureen has it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't have any more questions of you right now. I just want to look at the deed references on this plan. But I'll, I'll let. I'm done my questions at this moment. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Berry, along with what Peter was asking. In order for you to do one of those tests, you have to have a license of some sort in order for us to accept those. Uh, That's you, correct. Yeah. And so you're I'm a professional engineer registered in the state of Maine. So in order for you to say something like this for us to accept it, um, you have to have that license. That's correct. And you did the test. So. Um, could you go through a little bit of the... Um, for the people here, I, I know they're concerned about the amount of water that comes off this property, and that's really all we're concerned about at this point. Can you go over how you calculate those numbers just briefly? Uh, the calculations are standard calculations, and, uh, and they're defined in the state of Maine in the Best Management Practices Manual and uh, several other you know, standard manuals. And what we do is we take a situation and we run a two-year storm, which is three inches of rain, a 10-year storm, which is 4.7 inches of rain, and a 25-year storm, which is five and a half inches of rain, through the calculations. And uh, what is, and in this particular case, we run it down the ditches, through the culverts, and uh, to see if the culverts have capacity to handle a 25-year storm. In this particular case, the eight-inch existing pipe did not have capacity, so we were able, if we upgraded it to a 12-inch, it did have capacity, and so in this particular case, uh, the downstream people should actually want this work done, whether the job was able to go or not, because it's going to improve their situation specifically in their driveway. And yet, and you're talking about the uh, the uh, culvert that's going across Katahdin Road, 
Right. That you're across the Patton Road to the existing catch base. And you're going to improve that capacity? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, question about the, to put, maybe put some of the people's mind at ease, you said you were going to hammer the ledge if you had to. Uh, in your experience, does that create any problems anywhere beyond the property? And if it does, have you got contingency to cover that? Uh, generally, hammering, if you blast, uh, you have a, you know, you send a shock wave out. If you hammer it, there is very little to no shock wave, so it's a much less uh, <laughs> impacting situation by hammering. It's a lot of work, but it uh, protects the butter. So you're basically doing that to uh, relieve the possibility of other problems? That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> That's all the questions I have right now. Uh, I know when you when you blast, you have to. Uh, <clears throat> I think the law requires you do video tape of foundations that abut the area and to <clears throat> determine whether there are any cracks appear in the blasting. Do you do that also when you hammer that ledge? Uh, I don't, no, I don't believe it's done. Uh, would you be taking any precautions to ensure that the hammering would not do any damage to? foundations in the area? Well, well, hammering is just taking a hammer and knocking the ledge out, and it's not that much weight or that much impact. I don't know what kind of hammer you're talking about, but I would expect if it's continuous ledge, uh, the impact and the shock is going to be transmitted through the ledge to... Well, what it is if you blast, you're, you're imparting a lot of energy into the ledge to shatter it, to, to make it come up. If you hammer it, you're just taking it off a piece at a time. It's like if you had a a big rock in front of you, and you wanted to blow it up, into, or as opposed to taking a hammer and chipping it off. And uh, it's so the amount of energy used is much, much less with hammering. I mean, I've seen big hammers, so I don't, I don't know exactly what you're intending. I mean, even a big hammer is, is very minor compared to a, a uh, dynamite blast. Because a dynamite blast sets off a shock wave, is what it does. Mm -hmm. Well, let me restate the question and simply ask, would you be taking any precautions to ensure that new cracks were not developed in neighboring foundations? I think chipping the ledge with a hammer is the precaution we're taking versus blasting. I mean, it just, to use this site, there has to be some ledge work done. And uh, ledge blasting has been done in the neighborhood many times before, like when the sewer system went in. Uh, in the early 80s and, uh, and other times, it's, and it's quite common. This way we're protecting everyone to the best extent possible. And how would you respond if, uh, in a, if an abutter claimed that their foundation had new cracks or enlarged cracks as a consequence of the hammer? Well, the, the contractor would have to have insurance to cover it, and, uh, and they would go out there and do an investigation to see if it's true or not, and if it was true, uh, they'd be liable. Yeah, that's why you know, the well, that's what my whole question is about. When you blast, you're required to do a video recording of the foundations in the area, but you don't tend to do that. Is that my understanding correct? It's not common practice to do that. Are you willing to, uh, I have several questions, but about the blasting, are you willing to put that on the plans? because I think it's important that it be of record that you are required not to blast. Yes, we can put it on the plans. Because it is not on the plans. I looked for it specifically because we discussed it in some detail. And I think it's imperative that it be in the plans. Right. Yeah, we could put it on the plans or you could, it could make it a condition of approval. Yes, I know that. <laughs> all right, I, I, would, I would like to say, first of all, that I commiserate with all of you. I really do. I understand, and I think we all do, that you value this empty land, and I would too if I lived in your neighborhood. Uh, however, I would like to ask Maureen to speak a little bit about paper streets. We're, we're in a difficult position because if this is a legal paper street and it's a legal lot and we have a zoning code to follow, we can't make up the rules. We have some flexibility, but we don't have flexibility to change the zoning code. And so I would like to ask Maureen, please, to address paper streets and how Shore Acres developed a long time ago and how this affects this particular area. Um, 
there's been a lot of questions about the paper streets. The state legislature passed, uh, excuse me, I can't hear you, I'll shout then. Uh, the state legislature, can you hear me now? Okay. Passed a law in the mid-90s because there's a lot of paper streets throughout the state of Maine and uh, there's a, a relatively expensive process to vacate the streets, to wipe them off the books. And a lot of property owners had gone through that expense and there was a complaint that, that, that there should be an easier way. So the state legislature passed a law that said any paper street that hasn't been built as of September 1997 will be deemed vacated unless a town either builds it or extends its rights in it for 20 years. Because of that law, the town of Cape Elizabeth and several other communities did a paper street study in 1997. That study did an inventory of paper streets. It also did a review of the law on paper streets. That review was done by uh, some interns at the Greater Portland Council of Government, but they got their legal interpretations from attorneys at the Maine Municipal Association. And there was a report that was created as part of that. And as part of the report, there were some frequently asked questions that were created and answered, and I just want to read two of them. Uh, one is, what rights does the town have in paper streets? It is presumed that when a subdivider lays out a plan with one or more new streets, the intent is to dedicate these streets to the public, that is the town. When the plan is approved and recorded, this establishes the town's right of, quote, incipient dedication. This means that the town has the right to accept the street and the owner subdivider cannot revoke that right. The dedication is incipient until the town accepts the street. The right of incipient dedication is a public right in a proposed street. And the town has not made an effort to either vacate its incipient dedication rights in the street or to exercise those rights and actually build the street. So it, main, it, it remains a paper street where the town has potential rights but we haven't exercised them. The second question, what rights do lot owners have in paper streets? <coughs> The purchaser of a lot shown on a subdivision plan receives an implied easement appurtenant to his or her lot to use the street. In other words, when a lot is purchased, it is in reliance that all the streets depicted on the subdivision plan would be built. All lot owners in the subdivision, not just direct abutters to that paper street, have an implied easement. This implied easement held by individual lot owners exists independently of the public's right of incipient dedication. What this means is that plan up there, every single lot that is shown on that plan, every property owner that owns that lot, and every mortgagee of every lot on that plan has a right in this road. Anyone who is on that subdivision plan that owns a lot can build this road. The only thing they need to do is they need to come into the town if they're doing things like altering wetlands or in the case of this particular property owner, he's not proposing to build a public or a private road that would gain him the frontage he needs to make this lot buildable. He's proposing to build what we call a private access way. It's kind of like a private road light. It's, 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 it's a driveway, but if we review it and we make sure that there's adequate access for emergency vehicles to go up this road and service that particular lot, he can count that driveway as part of his street frontage requirement. But he can only do that once. Anyone else who wants to use this private access, a private access way is only good for one lot. So if anyone else wants to drive up his driveway, and they can, anyone else in this subdivision has rights in this paper street. Any, not the public, but everyone else in the subdivision. So someone who lives in Broad Cove, who doesn't own a lot in Shore Acres, doesn't necessarily have the right to drive up this driveway. But anyone in Shore Acres that owns a lot on that plan has the right to be in this paper street. But if someone else wants to get access off of this street and create frontage for another lot, they need to come back to the town and build what we call a private or a public road. So he's, he's the first one in, but anyone else can come in at a future date and go ahead and build that road. But 
road construction is expensive. So the thought is that only someone who has some expectation of getting some profit would actually invest the money in building the road. That's why we usually look at the people who are directly abut the road as the people who would probably come in and build it. But that doesn't mean that someone else couldn't, for whatever reason, come in and build it. Does that answer your question on that? Does, any, does anybody on the board have any questions for Maureen in terms of this? I have some other questions, but go Dave, go ahead. I'm all done. Thanks okay. Right um, I'd like to talk about the trees. How many trees are you anticipating? I know there's one beauty you're going to take out, but how many trees do you think you'll take out? I think the public needs to hear that. And you've put in a few trees, but maybe we ought to talk about more buffering. Okay. Uh, I cannot answer <laughs> directly how many trees. I have not counted them, so I can show you the limits of the uh, cutting, though. On the right of way, it is a 50 foot, it's 50 feet wide, and what we're proposing to clear with, you know, for a 14 foot road with a two foot gravel shoulder on each side plus a ditch, so we'd probably be clearing in the in the neighborhood of about a 40 foot wide strip, uh, and I just don't know how many trees are within this area. And where the house is to be? Uh, I would. If I had to guess, I would say probably about half the building window would be used for the building itself. That would keep it in proportion size-wise to the other houses shown on the plan in the neighborhood. How much will removing all this vegetation affect the flow of water? Because when you do take vegetation out, it does affect the flow of water on a parcel. Uh, the soils uh, are somewhat more impervious than the uh, somewhat more pervious than the uh, the road and the ditches that will carry it down to the road quicker. That's why there's going to be a slight increase in runoff down to the ditch. That's why we have the ditch to act as a buffer in the 12 inch pipe to carry it off. So there will be some increase in runoff that amount and, it, and we've shown demonstrated in the calculations provided in our report. Have you calculated that? Yes, I have. Okay. And, and what kind of an increase are you showing? Uh, hold on a second. In the report, there's a table called pre-development conditions, another table called, called post-development conditions. Uh, if you compare the cult, actually the, the peak in for a two-year storm existing is 1.65 CFS. The peak in the post is 1.95 CFS, so it's an increase of 0.3 CFS, or about 15%. The 10-year storm goes from 3.21 to 3.78, and the 25-year storm goes from 3.95 to 4.65. Each one proportionally about the same. And in your professional opinion, changing the, the uh, culvert and redirecting some of that or making the ditch <clears throat> larger will take care of that. That's correct. I mean, the, going from a, we get about a 15% increase in, in flow in each storm event, and we get over, fit, over a 100% increase in pipe capacity. I had another question and I lost it, so let me ask if anybody else has. An, oh, I, I know what the other question is. Do you have another question? No. Here? My other question is that the public works director recommended that you put in enough capacity, build in enough capacity in the private access way for utilities more than you. That's correct. I started. And, and uh, what is your position on that? Or what is the developer's position? The, the developer's position is uh, that he'd prefer to put in the smaller pipes, but if the board wants the larger pipes, he'll do that. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. I, I'm not sure if I understood or misunderstood at a previous hearing that Mr. Pillsbury was building this lot, this house for himself. Is that correct or incorrect? Uh, You're I on just asked the question directly. It's, it's on short this point. I mean, I will, I will not be living in it. That's what I mean. I, I, I believe 
I, maybe I misunderstood at a previous hearing. You said you were sensitive to the neighbor's concerns because you were about to be their neighbor, implying that you would be living there. But, but I noticed several of the neighbors don't believe you'll be living there. So I was just curious what the current status of that is. <clears throat> uh, I will be staying on 2H Road. I will not be moving to the property. Okay. Are there other questions? One short. I, I, I just reviewed the engineer's um, statement relative to increasing or bringing the road standards up to condition that would support further houses. And um, I'm not sure that I would go along with that in view of some of the comments that were made tonight in the fact that we're not even sure anybody is going to build. And I, I would think that that would be a in my opinion, not a necessary thing to burden a present builder with, but that's my opinion. Meaning, which item is that, Dave? It's in uh, Steve Harding's letter uh, uh, to us regarding. Uh, let me go back to the well, town engineer's letter, and it, right. it's item. It's the, item number five. The utility upgrade. Yep. Okay. And you're not talking about the road crown issue. No. No. Do you have, do you have any opinions on that? By the way? I, I don't know. I, from a crown standpoint, I'm kind of feeling that it would make more sense to have the water run off to both sides and have the culverts pick up the excess and not but have it given, get into the street. My understanding is just slope their their proposal is to slope it toward. Yep the ditch they're creating to handle the excess right. and toward the increased capacity pipe, which... But it's, you know, I, 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 it could accurate? be either way. Um, it ends up in the same place. Yeah. If it does. Yeah. With a crown, it doesn't roll off the other side? No. Okay. The, the, the crown has no impact oh, I see, because on the it's drainage. Back in the gotcha. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. So the only issue there is the plowing issue. That's correct. Thank you. I, I do want to make another point and have Maureen speak to that. There were some questions about whether or not this was a buildable lot. And some people believe and I, um, that it wasn't a buildable lot at one time. And I'd like Maureen to please explain also when this became a buildable lot or was it always a buildable lot? Well, I, I pulled the original subdivision plan, and the original plan was recorded in 1911. So um, it's, you know, we've pre been presented with evidence that some of the lots have had independent legal restrictions placed on them, and where a private property owner sure. has independently restricted its property, property uh, the town regulation would not supersede that. Where, however, there is nothing but a recorded lot in this registry, and then there's the town regulation, uh, the town has for a long time recognized that there are many, many non conforming lots in the town. We have a town this size, we have approximately 200 recorded subdivisions in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Just to give you um, some comparison, I believe the town of Yarmouth has about 80. So we have a lot of already uh, recorded subdivisions. And I did go back as far as the 1968 zoning ordinance. And even in 1968, it states that a main building may be erected on land smaller than required if it contains not less than 10,000 square feet and it has public sewer. If it, if it doesn't have public sewer, there are still ways to make it buildable at 10,000 square feet. Uh, and it recognizes as long as the land consists of one or more continuous areas separately bounded and numbered for conveyance as platted upon a lawfully recorded subdivision plan. So uh, the current ordinance recognizes that this is a legal non-conforming lot based on all the information that we've been submitted. If there is some legal restriction on the property that we're not aware of, um, the developer, I believe the board has taken the position in the past that a developer who ignores something like that proceeds at their own risk. Um, but we can find in our records nothing under the town ordinance that prohibits this lot from being can, built on, except the fact that it doesn't have frontage on a town road right now. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Um, I just lost it again. I had another question. If, if I could just add one more comment. Uh, I've talked with uh, Mr. Pillsbury, and he's willing to do a pre-blast survey of the neighborhood, uh, the budding houses, uh, for the benefit of everyone. If that's, you know, we could put that in the uh, on the plan too. No blasting, but we'll do a pre-blast survey. I know what my other question is. How many other buildable lots? And I think this is important in terms of a decision made about the utilities are there on that paper street some um, some of the the yeah no that was fun some of the the like. deeds that were presented this evening suggest that there are no addition that there, there are at least some restrictions private restrictions on the southern side although I'm, I'm hearing discussions from from people that even those restrictions wouldn't necessarily right. preclude something happening right um, further, I didn't see anything in those restrictions that precluded someone from building the road just to move their driveway to another location. Uh, I didn't. Look and in fact, one one of the deeds, and I was perusing them quickly, didn't say anything about not being able to build on a lot. It just said you had to preserve some of the trees on the lot. Right. That's that was one. So three. I would. I mean, not having information on having re and not going to the registry and reviewing each deed to each lot just looking at this old subdivision plan, I would say there's easily four to six lots that can be accessed off of the street because there's not only lots off of what we're now calling Bigelow Road, but Bigelow Road connects up with another road which on the plan is called Oak Grove, which also is not constructed, but it's a road that runs more north-south. and. I've received a call from at least one property owner that has a lot on Oak Grove that was incensed when he thought that we were actually vac proposing to vacate this area. So there are people who may want to have access through this road to get to the lots on Oak Grove. So the, I think the short answer is we're really not sure how many potential lots out there, but our best guess is at least four, possibly more. Is that a fair summary? On a motion. You ready for a motion? Yeah. Okay. I was, before we make the motion, do you want to word that um, such as uh, no construction would take place until the pre blast survey is, is uh, performed? You know, I think there's one thing that we really haven't talked any more about, and that is do we want to require some more buffering? In, uh, for abutters or because there are a lot of trees that are going to be taken out. Where would you, where would you be inclined to put them, Barbara? I'm just trying to understand what you're proposing. Well, and they, they put some around the rear of the property up in that area, but in that area there's some more buffering. Well, the north, I, I'm, where's the north arrow? The top side of the, of the print. Is that north? This way. So is that what you're proposing, Barbara? My understanding just is they're clearing the, the, the access way and they're clearing about half of the building envelope. Is that a fair summary? That's correct. That's a fair assessment. So around the rear, depending on where they cite the house exactly, they're really not, not, they're not, trees they're not taking the anything the building down. Window. I'm sorry? There were not many trees in the rear of the building window. Okay. Fair enough. Appreciate that. So that's why you're looking to put some... Well, because there are a lot of other trees that are coming down and... You know, it might be something we can do. The marks on the on the north end of the lot; those are additions that you're putting in for a buffer there. Is that, that correct? That's correct. We proposed five new trees already. But have you talked about size of those trees? Uh, I'd have to ask the landscape architect on <laughs> sizes. My name is John Griffin, and I work for uh, Mitchell and Associates. And you know, we're proposing five pine trees here as a buffer, and you know they would most likely go in at approximately you know eight foot 
seven, eight foot um, in height, and they would grow from that point on. So they would be fairly substantial trees to start with then? Yes. Thank you. You ready? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Number one, Graham Pillsbury is requesting a private access way permit to construct a driveway within a road right of way to access a lot located off Katahdin Road, U12-5C, which requires review under section 19-7-9 private access way. Number two, the town engineer is recommending revisions to the plans consistent with the town design standards. Number three, the application substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private access way. Yes, before you go any further. Yes. I just wanted to know that uh, proposed condition number one, what I tried to do for you there is you don't need to read this, the things that are in parentheses. Yep. I just gave you headings for each of those paragraphs so that you could pick and choose which things you want to require as a condition and which one you don't. Okay. In, so, for example, where it says that the plans be revised for the comments of the town engineer's letter, yes. paragraphs four, if you don't want to require the row crown, don't pick paragraph four. Okay. Five is utility upgrade and so on. I understand that. Okay. Okay. To continue, therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted and facts presented, the application of Grand Pillsbury for a private access way permit to construct a driveway to access a lot located off Katahdin Road be approved subject to the following condition, that the plans be revised per the comments of the town engineer's letter, paragraph five, uh, Paragraph 6, maximum grade, and number 7, paragraph number 7, surveyor stamp dated 3705. Number 2, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the plans have been revised and approved by the town planner. And number 3, that no construction shall start until the owner of the property does a pre-blast survey. Okay. Um, there's no requirement in here that there be no blasting, and I won't approve it without a requirement want, for no blasting. Would you like to amend that? The developer agreed to that, is that right? Yeah. Pardon? The developer agreed to that, so... But well, but agreeing no, to I, it I, verbally I, I and agree. agreeing to it in writing are agreed. two different things. He was going... <coughs> So we'll put uh, condition number four. Well, I, I actually think it's a condition before um, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the plans have been revised, because I'd like that in the plans. So, so you so would you want like to see it on the plans? Yes, I wanted a condition in the plans. Okay. So you want a, that a note be added to the plans yes. that there shall be no blasting, no blasting that shall be removed by camera? That. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you may understand it, but understanding it, if you're not here tomorrow, somebody else comes along and it's not in writing, it's no good. It needs to be in writing. So would you like to uh, amend number two? Just add another condition. Just, just add another condition if you... You can add it onto that condition, sure. So in other words, we'll continue on number two, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the plan's been revised and approved by the town planner, and that a note be placed on the plans that there will be no blasting on the site. Yes, thank you. Is there anyone who wants to add back in either um, four or five as per Bob Malley's suggestion? I don't, and I second the motion. Any further discussion? No. Nope. Okay. All those in favor of the... I have to tell you, I'm doing it reluctantly because I understand all your concerns, but our hands are really tied because this is a legal lot and the paper street is legal 
And the only thing you could have done was buy the lot yourself. And I'm really sorry, but they have met all the conditions for a private access way. Thank you. Madam Chair, I move that, I move that we adjourn. Oh, second. Second is all, all favor. favor. Hot new or whatever she was saying. <laughs>